My name is Stanley Sword and I have the great privilege to sit here with Thomas Backhaus from Germany, professor in environmental sciences in Gothenburg. Yes. So I'm in the middle between Gothenburg and, and Germany, so you kind of stopped here in the way. <laughs> sort of, yes. Yeah. yeah. And you measure the different chemicals and waste in the water. So you said if we take a little liter of water out there, you will be able to find hundreds of different chemicals. Yes, depending on where you take the sample, but that's basically what you do. Whenever you take a sample of a water body or of a piece of land or something like that, you find dozens or even hundreds of chemicals being there at the same time. Yeah. And now when there's a newborn and they take, they take a blood, blood sample, they find a lot of chemicals there as well. Yes, you find chemicals also in the body of every person that is walking the earth at the moment and also uh, those people that are just born. So they are basically born pre-polluted. Yeah, so an innocent child isn't so innocent anymore. It's like a, the sins of the father, the sins of the mother, the sins of the world are kind of... Yes, yeah. From yeah. start. Yes. And, and uh, all these different kind of... Uh, cleanses and and uh, you know having a diet to to depollute your body so to yeah. say they're not effective uh, you? that is it's a marketing scam i really don't think that this is something that people should be doing uh, i mean living in a healthy environment uh, eating healthy food or good food i mean that's the way to go for those cleanses and detoxification diets and stuff like that that yeah. usually doesn't work um, we have to accept the fact that we are living in very intimate contact with a lot of chemicals so it's not that surprising that you also find them in your bodies um, the question is how much of a problem is that and what can we do about that and um, the only way to uh, limit the body burden of those chemicals is to actually uh, stop taking them, getting them into your body. And that means living in a clean environment, uh, eating food without pesticides and uh, things like that. Yeah. So your advice is to eat organic and, and kind of de-cleanse the body in the long term. Take in less uh, poisons than, than, we, than we burn in the body because the liver and, and different organs, they, they, they kind of use up the poisons as well. We, we, uh, uh, we yeah. cleanse our body... In a natural way, in the long term. Yes, um, so if I can unpack that a bit. I mean, what we know is that organic food uh, contains lower amounts of pesticides than conventionally grown food. Um, and that, of course, implies when you eat organic food, you are taking in lower amounts of pesticides into your body. That does not mean that conventional food is uh, problematic per se. That's then the next step to do that. But if you want to be... Sure, if you want to be safe, um, that's exactly the way to go to lower the amount of pesticides getting into your body. Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, your research is on, on both food, what comes into the food, and what comes into the nature. Different uh, poisons, different chemicals, and from, from, from uh, uh, drugs as well. Your, yeah. your PhD was... Um, my PhD was on antibiotics in the environment, but that's that's a while ago. Way uh, what, back when? Yeah, uh, 1999 or something. When, like when I think you were young. When <laughs> I was young, yes. Thank you for that. The, um, no, but but I think what we are doing right now is oh, what what people start to realize is that it's not just one type of chemical that we're exposed to. It's not just pesticides. It's not just heavy metals, but it's the whole chemical cocktail that we're exposed mm -hmm. to that we sort of need to get a better understanding of how problematic that is or whether it is problematic in the first place, which chemicals are playing a role for which kind of toxicity, which kind of creatures are most sensitive, uh, and to try to get a better understanding of what's actually going on there. And how they interact with one another is, is, is a truly complex thing. Yes. It's, uh, it's super, super hard to figure out how different chemicals interact. And then in the long term, which effects it has on the body, whether it gives cancer or not. Yes, but... Um... 
it's definitely if you look at things in detail it's becoming mind-bogglingly complex because we have so many chemicals and we have so many different creatures and every person is different um, but what we try to do is we try to find the overall pattern. We try to look at the big picture and try to come up with rough rules of thumb that allow us to get a good first impression. Is there reason for concern? Is there a case to answer? And what can we do about that? And if we have a suspicion that things might be happening there, then you could drill deeper and go for better models. You can do specific experiments or things like that. But given the thousands of chemicals that we have, we can't do that for every possible exposure scenario. You said that every hour there are new chemicals being invented. Discovered. They are either invented or they are, they are found in the environment. But we are looking at around 40 new chemicals each and every hour. So when yeah. we are done with this interview, we have 40 new chemicals yeah. known to mankind. And altogether, there are roughly 2 million different chemicals. I don't, it's several million. I don't know how many million. I would need to look up that number. But it's a mind-bogglingly big number of chemicals um, not all of them are used by humanity for anything. Only comparatively few are used in, in substantial amounts. So on the European market, we have around 20,000 so-called industrial chemicals and maybe another couple of thousand pesticides and pharmaceuticals that come on top of that. Yeah. But we're still looking at several thousand of chemicals that we have in everyday products uh, that we're using for a lot of different purposes. And... In the history, there were some international bans. There were conferences, in, like in Stockholm, with the DDT, yeah, and and um, ozone, the gas before before that. No. Tell tell us about those. Those. How, how are we able to to limit the, the negative impacts, and how are we able to ban bad? Because they're different. You can tax them, you can cut them out altogether, or you can ban them for specific uses, just like in food or in the pharmaceutical yeah. purposes. Yeah, chemicals are regulated on different levels. We have the, the national legislation, so Sweden is doing or has, have, has a certain uh, type of legislation. Then we have the European legislation and then we have the international uh, bodies or the international uh, agreements. And the Stockholm Convention is one of them. The Montreal Protocol for the ozone depleting uh, substances is another one. Um, and so that means we're acting on different um, scales. Um, and when we are talking about persistent compounds that are traveling all around the globe, when we're talking about gases um, that are traveling around the globe and that have global impacts, then of course it makes a lot of sense to uh, have international agreements. Mm -hmm. But very often uh, chemicals are used locally and then uh, it makes a lot of sense to have a, a, a regulation or legislation for a particular country that is using a particular chemical for a certain purpose. Yeah. So that's why we have a layered system uh, depending on what kind of chemical and what kind of use of a chemical we are actually looking at. And, and my father's mother, she became 99 and a half and grew up by the Baltic Sea. And her father was a fisherman and they, you know, they ate fish every day. And they become, became healthy and strong and, and so on. But, but today it's more complex because the Baltic Sea has a lot of different neighbors. And, and the, the fish there, if you eat it every day, you don't become 99 and a half anymore. Most, well, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, you're definitely right. The Baltic Sea is one of the more heavily polluted uh, marine areas um, that we have because it's a very confined area. We only have a very small water exchange to the Atlantic Ocean and we have a lot of people living around the Baltic Sea uh, that are emitting a lot of uh, chemical waste or wastewater streams into the Baltic and that's a huge problem. And that's different chemicals. We have. We still have a cadmium problem. We still have a mercury problem. We still have a problem with eutrophication, for example. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of room for improvement when it comes to the Baltic. That's mm. for sure. And and uh, we have the European Union. Uh, and the, one of the good things there that we all can agree upon, perhaps not the not the chemistry companies like Buffs and so on, but but. Uh, most people that that the the uses are of uh, pesticides and uh, chemicals are limited and, and regulated 
across borders so that we kind of our whole because the, the, the air which blows above us now doesn't come from Sweden it comes from Denmark and Germany and so on and Poland we're all more interconnected these days than we were before yes no and I mean one of the the, the basic ideas of the European Union is to have a common marketplace where we can freely trade goods across uh, country borders. And that means uh, one of the ideas of the chemical regulation in Europe is to have a level playing field for everybody. And that basically means we have the same protection for workers that are working in, in factories and in companies that are producing chemicals. We have the same protection for consumers that are eating food that have been produced in another country country and then shipped across the border and we also want to protect the environment to the same extent. So the idea is to have a, a, a level playing field uh, for everybody involved there. And uh, you were involved in a couple of non-profits in Switzerland. I'm involved in, in two non-profit organizations in Switzerland that are working uh, on chemicals that try to raise awareness, that try to to communicate, that try to facilitate communication between the different stakeholders, so between companies, between consumers, between regulatory authorities, uh, and in order to to sort of uh, yeah just promote the knowledge exchange there. Mm. And tell us about the regular day at, at, at your you work 50, 60 hours a week. And, and uh, you have communicate, uh, commuted with, with Germany for 15 years. Your wife lives in Germany. And she has a, uh, a little store there. She left your field. You were in the same field before. But she's working with the beautiful wine and, and the cheeses and, and uh, yep. the most great things in life. Yeah. She's working with good food. And I yeah. certainly enjoy that. And you make sure the, the, the good food are... Not filled with pesticides. Uh, well, that at least so, I'm. I'm not involved in that. No, I mean, what what we are really doing is we're working. Uh, we try not to work and get involved in the economic operations of companies. We are trying to work. Uh, with uh, regulations, we try to come up with ideas on how you can improve things, how you can either raise awareness, how you can generate knowledge. And uh, we try to, to provide options for the European Commission, for the Chemicals Inspectorate in Sweden or the German Environmental Agency. We're currently working for the Swedish government in order to basically uh, provide options. These are the possibilities that you can do if you want to achieve things certain things. Whether you actually do that or whether you do something else or whether you ignore that, that's then not our decision to take. We just provide the possibilities and then it's up to a, an authority to take it up or to take it or leave it. Um, and my Coming back to your initial question on my typical day, I'm not sure whether I have a typical day. It's uh, That's one of the nice things, uh, being a university professor and running research projects, uh, is that most days are different from each other. So there are certain things that I do uh, on a routine basis, like lecturing and then teaching and then discussing our research projects with the members of my research group. But then it's also a lot of writing up your research and publishing that research, having interviews with people like you, for example, so the sort of outreach and communication uh, type of activities. And it, sometimes uh, one of those issues is more prominent and more in the foreground, sometimes it's something else, so that really changes and that's part of uh, the, the interesting side of that type of job. Mm. But a regular day in, in science, how, how do you go about it in a, in a practical way? How do you re how do you research? Um, well, how do you research? I mean, the first thing is uh, to decide on what you think is worthwhile researching. There are so many open questions. There are so many potentially interesting things. So you need to decide on what you want to focus on, uh, the issues that you want to uh, work together with your colleagues on, or where you want to start up new collaborations, etc. So that basically means. The first thing is simply reading a lot and reading a lot across the board, reading scientific papers, but also reading uh, newspaper articles, decent newspaper articles, uh, trying to keep updated with the political development, uh, what's happening in the area of, of science policy or on chemical policy and 
what are people struggling with and can you help them or, or are there open questions that you want to work with um, so that's definitely one thing then um, that's one say general building block and then of course it's also um, the active communication writing up your thoughts writing up your research results communicating that to your colleagues in, in scientific papers but also trying to to stimulate debates or reacting to debates and debate articles and and reports and things like that ah and then in, in a practical sense you take a liter of water in the river or how do you go about that uh, that that depends a bit on what we are actually researching. Our area is the the um, toxicity side of things or the hazard side of things. So we are not really interested in measuring how many chemicals are there. We are more interested in analyzing how toxic is a chemical. So we are collaborating with people all across Europe and across the globe uh, in terms of finding the chemicals we're working together with analytical chemists who are going out and then they come back with a long list of these are the chemicals that i'm finding and then we sort of try to find out are they toxic are they not toxic and which compounds are potentially important and when we have identified compounds that we find important then we take our creatures that could be anything from microbes to, to um, crustaceans, so, so uh, crabs and things like that, and, and we expose them uh, under controlled conditions to that chemical and see what's happening. And then we get an idea, is that a problem, is that not a problem? So we do so-called concentration or dose response curves, and then we get an idea at that concentration, half of them are dying or um, they stop growing or they stop respiring or something like that. And that gives us an idea on whether the concentrations that the analytical chemists have been finding is a problem or is not a problem. Mm. And that allows, uh, that perhaps coming back to the initial thing about the pesticide in food, etc. I think we have to, we have to uh, sort of think about how we are reacting when we find a chemical. The problem is uh, Analytical chemistry, our ability to detect chemicals is really good, has become really good over the last year. So mm. the methods are really, really sensitive, uh, which is good because then we, we know what we're dealing with. But that also implies that not everything that we're finding is cause for concern. It could be that those concentrations are far too low to actually really cause toxic impacts. So it's always a question of what is there, how much is there, how long is it there, and who is actually exposed. And you have to take all those factors into consideration mm. in order to be able, in the end, to draw the conclusion, this is an acceptable exposure, and this is an exposure that is too high, we need to do something about that. And there's a huge gray area between that, and that's what we try to shed a bit of light on. Mm. And, and how do you then de determine whether you know, on, on 30, 40 years um, down, down the drain in, 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 in our future, whether these different chemicals and, and, and poisons will transform our bodies into giving us cancer. That's, that's always the challenge. And I think everybody involved is doing the best they can at the moment but the problem is predicting things is damn hard i mean we know that weather forecast might work reasonably <laughs> well but not all the time sometimes you get nasty surprises and i think that's exactly the challenge that we're also having when we're trying to predict the long-term consequences of chemical exposure so we have to be really careful and we have to be able to basically react on things when unforeseen things are happening. And we can only do that when the chemicals that we are using, when we know which chemicals we are using, we know which companies are putting chemicals on the market and where they occur. So we need to measure and monitor them. But it also implies that we should be using chemicals that are not too persistent in the mm. environment. If we have chemicals that are very stable in the environment, as mm. soon as they enter the environment, they are there. You can't do anything about them. You just have to live with them. 
And that is a huge problem. And the typical example for that would be, for example, the PCBs. The PCBs are a type of industrial chemicals that have been used in the 50s, 60s, uh, something like that. And uh, only and, and they are very good in, in, uh, from the perspective that, for example, they are not flammable. So it's very good from an occupational health hazard perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so they were very popular. Um, but people later realized that they are endocrine disruptors, so they basically interfere with the uh, development, with the sexual development uh, of, of uh, kids. Um, so they were banned. They are not allowed to be used anymore. But they're still out there because they are not degraded. And what mm -hmm. we see is that especially those animals at the top of the uh, food chain they are tremendously struggling. They are basically becoming infertile. And they are infertile these days because they are exposed to chemicals that have been in the environment for half a century yeah. already. And that basically is the problem when you're working with those persistent chemicals. So one way forward in order to improve things and in order to allow you to react on unforeseen developments is to use chemicals that are not that stable when they are in the environment. Young people today who want to work in your field, who, who want to you know, uh, contribute to making a better tomorrow with a better, better environment, both for, for uh, nature and us humans, what, what would be your three best pieces of advice? Where, where, where should they focus? Well, the first thing is they, they should just get a decent education, which is in Sweden, basically everybody who's going to a university gets a decent education. But I think because we have so many different chemicals and we have so many different uses, you just need to have a broad knowledge and a broad understanding. I think that's definitely one thing um, which is uh, uh, um, the basis of everything. Mm -hmm. I think people are need uh, people need to become aware that the use of chemicals is always always has a political side of things. There's always people have different values uh, and different perceptions of what uh, in terms of how how they value their health and how many risks they want to take with certain chemicals and with certain products. And so there's always a continuous debate on whether certain chemicals should be used or should be not used and whether we should go for organic food or conventional food and those type of things. And I think the, the main thing is you have to be aware that that perspective is always there. Where you position yourself is then your own value judgment, your own uh, perspective, but you have to be aware that this is definitely something that's happening. And which is the most acute areas? Because everyone knows about the global warming and stuff, you know, and, 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 but where on, and, on, on poisons and, and, and these kind of things, chemicals, what are the most acute things to, we should be washing out for? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I would dare to really come up with a, an absolute list of priorities and saying that these, this is the most important problem that we're having. I can list a couple of problems that we're certainly facing, but um, I'll leave the ranking to you or to any viewers of this video. Um, so what, what we're seeing right now is that we have a tremendous decline in biodiversity, whether it's the biodiversity below soil, whether it's the biodiversity in terms of insects or vertebrates, uh, so biodiversity is declining all around us and chemicals are not the sole reasons but they are definitely a heavily contributing factor uh, and we need to stop that. Uh, we can't afford to let that run, uh, we just need to see that we can improve that. So mm. that's for me one of the critical areas. How can we continue to use chemicals but at the same time protect biodiversity and yeah. of course that might imply that we need to scale back chemical use a bit but and biodiversity is like the soil you can't just grow corn there for 20 years straight it's it's like you have to let the fields rest and, yeah. and, and grow different things on the fields and agriculture is definitely one of the critical factors there uh, in terms of uh, i don't think that agriculture is supporting biodiversity as much as it could be doing uh, so i think there's room for improvement there so there's definitely a discussion that we need to have about that but of course it's also that we're building more roads that we're building houses and more houses and bigger houses and things like that that all is cutting into the habitats uh, the natural habitats uh, that different creatures want to also to live in. So um, I think we also there we need to see how we balance uh, those different 
uses yeah. of a landscape. So once we fix the biodiversity, what's the next? Uh... Well, the other thing that, that uh, switching perhaps just for a change from, from the environment to the human side of things, uh, one of the main challenges that are at least partly related to chemicals when it comes to human health is the more and or, or the, the increasing realization that uh, we are having more and more problems with antibiotic resistant bacteria um, with the worry that our antibiotics that we're using in human medicine for basically every surgery that we're doing for a lot of the infections that we're having etc that they stop working uh, we have not a lot of companies that are working in that area that are actively developing new drugs and at the same time we are overusing uh, the antibiotics that we're having uh, for example for for animal farming and things mm. like that so that they are just losing their effectiveness and we're losing the tools that we need for modern medicine uh, so that's definitely another type of, of chemically driven or chemical driven problem that we sort of need to continue to, to work on. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, of course, also we have to think about and we have to perhaps optimize that a bit. We are living very intimately connected with a lot of chemicals. We have a lot of chemicals in our households. We are overusing um, certain types of uh, household products. Um, we have a lot of food packaging where chemicals are leaching from the packaging into our food mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that also might have long-term health consequences uh, because again we have different exposure uh, pathways that are all hitting your body and uh, nobody really knows what does the overall toxic load um, that you have in your body, what does that actually do? So I think there's, that's more an area where there is active research going on and where we need more research. Mm. And uh, your PhD was, was uh, in antibiotics, how it uh, comes into the nature, into the water. So if we go out here now, we'll find antibiotics in the water? Well, not in that bay here. Uh, the thing is with the bay, the nice thing there is that uh, the dilution is so big um, that I guess you won't be able to find anything there. But, but in the ponds and in the rivers? If we're going to a river, especially when we're going somewhere uh, to a river where there's a sewage treatment plant nearby, we definitely are going to find antibiotics. Colleagues of ours have been monitoring uh, sewage streams uh, across uh, Sweden and you basically find antibiotics everywhere. Mm. Um, that's just a consequence of us using them. And, and what, what does that mean to nature? What, what effects does it have? I'm not, uh, that's something that we don't really know uh, what kind of effect it has on nature. A lot of the antibiotics or, comp or chemicals that are very similar to antibiotics are natural chemicals that you have there. Um, I think the main reason is, uh, or what we are, what um, the, the concern is, that they are becoming very good at actually um, tolerating those antibiotic exposures and those tolerant bacteria when we, we uh, are exposed to them because we go swimming or things like that, they might enter your body and that basically might change um, the, the sensitivity of the bacteria that are living in or around your body. Yeah. And that doesn't have any consequences for you as long as you're healthy, but it might have a problem when you have an infection and you are getting treated and then you just lost one of your lights uh, and um, then you are actually, um, and I lost the, what I wanted to say, and yeah. th then basically, then basically um, because um, the, the bacteria in and around your body are used to that, that um, means that the antibiotics that you are taking might actually not work that well. Mm. And we see that very clearly when, when people are traveling. That's, it's mm. really interesting when people are traveling, for example, to India, um, and uh, you basically take samples of their bacteria from their gut, uh, you see that uh, even within the couple of weeks that you were in India, you are starting to acquire antibiotic resistance because um, the levels of antibiotics in the Indian environment is much higher than here uh -huh. often. So we can clearly see uh, that the travel really changes um, the, the microbial communities in yeah. and around your body. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and how can you, what can you do as an individual to kind of create the best possible future for you? 
so I that think when you need antibiotics, they really work in your um, body? Well, one thing is to, to move to Sweden, because in Sweden the level of antibiotic resistance is actually uh, quite low compared to a lot of other countries. Um, I think the main thing is we have to be aware that uh, antibiotics are... are it's 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 really they are really really powerful chemicals they really do a lot of things but as the old saying goes with great power comes great responsibility yeah. so we should only take them when we really have to and i mean that's the critical thing so don't use old antibiotics that you still have lying around because you have a cold it doesn't work anyway so that sort of thing so talk with your doctors about that and only use them when really needed i think that's the critical thing um, one of the problems is uh, not in, in sweden and not in europe but antibiotics are sometimes also used in animal farming quite a bit mm. uh, which of course because then you use higher tonnages um, that's a, another problem um, so that's more something that we have to do on the political level to convince people we first and foremost should reserve those antibiotics for human use and if i were to make you environmental minister in, in uh, the European Union or, or in the US or in China, what, what, <laughs> what uh, would be the first change you would make towards oh a God. better future? <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick question. Um, well, you mentioned three very, very different countries with very different uh, societies and very different ways on how to move forward and what what those countries want to do, and the European Union is not one country, but 27 or 28 countries. Um, so it's it's different things there. Um, I think I think what I would like to strive for in any of those positions is uh, we have to be aware that chemicals are a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they are incredibly useful. Uh, our society is based on chemicals. We like to use them in everything from driving from from fueling our cars to pharmaceuticals to building material to pesticides etc etc so they have a lot of very positive uses but that comes with a cost mm -hmm. and the critical thing will be to find the right balance there to find the right balance between between um optimizing the positive sides and minimizing the negative side of things and that and that's one thing the other thing is again what we know about chemicals, what we know about how toxic they are, at what concentrations and at what in, in what situation is still very, very limited. Mm -hmm. Which means that uh, we are flying a bit blind sometimes, depending a bit on the chemical. Some chemicals we know very well, others we have no idea about, and a lot in between. Uh, but that means you always have to have the option to act and that's the critical thing you can't use a chemical and then it's out there and you can't do anything about that so that's what i mentioned earlier to strive for chemicals uh, that are degradable chemicals that are basically disappearing if you stop using and producing them so that you mm. can act on mistakes that you have made in the past and mm. i think that's really critical to go into that direction uh, to have more chemicals of that nature and the history of chemicals i mean way back when in the roman empire people got poisoned by by uh, lead, lead. And, and But after the Second World War, there was a boom of chemicals. Tell us about the history of chemicals. Oh, the history of chemicals, thats I don't think we have time for that. But uh, when it comes to the, the time after the Second World War, um, I mean, DDT is, is perhaps one of the poster chart of chemicals. Uh, it's an insecticide. Uh, it, uh, actually, um, the, the people discovering their insecticidal properties were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for mm -hmm. DDT. And uh, the compound uh, was used after the Second World War intensively uh, for a, a lot of uh, disinfection purposes. So every every uh, um, school where kids have, have lice and things like that were fumed with DDT. Uh, it was used in, in big building projects. It was used to fight malaria, etc. And it does its job really, really well. Um, so that's why people were really enthusiastic about that. Um, it's only that after a prolonged time, people discovered that uh, with that great 
power and potency also come a lot of negative side effects. Uh, we had the Silent Spring uh, um, story from Rachel Carlson, which was basically kicking off the environmental movement where people start to realize, oops, uh, there is a dark side to that also. And mm -hmm. um, DDT is one of those chemicals that are extremely persistent. Mm. Uh, which means we're still finding that out there. It's still a common environmental pollutant everywhere, uh, although we stopped using that. Uh, and that, again, emphasizes the point that we should get away from those type of chemicals in the long run. Um, but that also, we, we see a similar debate now with plastic and the plastic pollution, which also started actually after the Second World War, the, the plastic revolution, you might call that. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the main problem that we have with plastic is its enormous persistency. It's As soon as um, the stuff is starting to float in the environment, it's extremely hard or even impossible to just get it back again. Mm -hmm. uh, so you lose control, you have no options to manage that. Um, which is a real problem there. So mm. it's again the persistency that makes the challenge. And, and one progress though is that uh, chemical weapons has been banned a lot of, b before like in Vietnam war, they used a lot of um, chemical warfare. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and nowadays it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of erased from, from earth, a lot of it. How's that, 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 that development? That's, that's really, that's beyond my area of expertise. I mean, those, those are chemicals that are made to kill humans. Um, uh, or, well, in the Vietnam War, it's actually compounds that are related to some of the, the pesticides that we're using these days. Um, but that's a completely different setting. And uh, so that's definitely outside my area of expertise. So mm. I can't really comment on that. Mm. And uh, is there any chemicals coming out you think that will save humanity like like you studied a lot about antibiotics is there any any good things that could cleanse our body in some sense that could could be that you know that um, I don't I don't think we should use chemicals to cleanse our body or anything like that. I know that there is still people are still for example uh, selling colloidal silver, so silver chloride solutions to clean your body, which is mind-bogglingly stupid. You should never ever ever do that. Uh, our body has adapted to handle a certain type of food and that's what we should give our body and then we are good to go. I don't think we need to cleanse or, or We eat. have like you know all the, the veins or 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 the bad fats, the cholesterol, and we, yeah. have, we have Alzheimer's kind of, you know, breaking down the body in the long run. But uh, it would be nice just to have something to to just boom. Yes, you know, it would re refresh yes, it, it and just yes, start all over, yes, like you know, like a computer yes. just pull the plug out and that, yeah, yes, reboot it. You know? Yes, would be nice. Not going to happen. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's how the human body uh, works. Uh, so we have to uh, accept the fact that we're getting older. Uh, we can only try to ensure that we're doing that in the most healthiest way possible um, and so take care of your body and that basically we know how that works. So healthy food, exercise, enough sleep, um, those are the kind of things that you should be doing. Avoiding certain types of chemicals like alcohol, for example, certainly also helps. Um, so so that's that's... That's wow. the way. That's the way. That's the to way go. to 100 years. Yes. Warm thank you for your research for humanity and, and the best <laughs> of luck for the years to come. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot.